I'll be right back. Be right back. All right, let's talk over <laughs> Um, for those of you, um, can you hear me on? Yeah, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, for those of you on Zoom, you're also welcome to ask questions. You can either unmute yourself or write things in the chat. Hopefully you all can hear me. All right. That, sure, that, that, that. Okay, let's get you go. All right, where to begin? Any requests? First I start, yeah. Sure, yeah. So let's start off with some revolution. So volumes of revolution. And let's say we have the following region. We'll do two of these, yeah. So the region enclosed by y equal to the natural log of x, x equal to zero, y equal to one, and y equal to zero. Revolve about the y-axis. So we're going to find that volume. Most of the time, when you have a volume question, unless it's specifically a region bounded by two curves that you're revolving, if it's more than two things, you almost always have to graph. Like there's really no other better way to do it. So I'm going to graph these four things, three of which are pretty straightforward. I mean, they're all pretty straightforward. So y equals natural log of x looks like this. Got an intercept at one zero. Um, x equals zero is the y-axis. So here's x equals zero. Here's y equals zero, which is the x-axis. And y equals one is this horizontal line up here. So the region we're looking at has to be bordered by all four of those things. So it's got to be this region here. You know, all right. For those of you just joining us, we're doing some volumes of revolution. So we're going around the y-axis. That means our integral is going to have to be in terms of y. 
We can also think about having to use a horizontal strip or a strip that is perpendicular to your axis of rotation. So here's our little strip. I would also point out that in this problem, the region is flush with the axis of rotation, or if you prefer, the axis of rotation is one of your boundaries, meaning that are we using the disc or the washer method? Disc, right, because there isn't an inner thing that we're missing. So this is definitely a disc method. The volume of our disc, well, again, we're just revolving this around. So if you revolve that little region around there, it's going to look like this disc. And the volume of that disc is the area pi times whatever the radius is squared times the thickness, which is a dy. Now, here's where you might encounter some issues. The radius is how far it is to this function over here. But we better not write natural log of x because we're doing things in terms of y. We have a dy. That means it has to be in terms of y. So you have to take this equation and solve for x. In other words, we're going to raise both sides as powers of e. So we're going to get e to the y equals e to the natural log of x or just x equals e to the y. So the volume of our disk is pi times e to the y squared dy. So the total volume is going to be the integral of that. I like to put the pi out front. It doesn't really matter. e to the y squared dy. And then if it's in terms of y, the limits of integration are how low and how high can your strip go. So the strip can go as low as y equals zero, as high as y equals one. The rest of this is not terrible if we do one thing. We have to rewrite e to the y squared as e to the y times e to the y, which is e to the two y. So we're gonna rewrite this as i times the integral from zero to one of e to the two y dy. We integrate we get e to the 2y divided by 2, evaluated from 0 to 1. We plug in, I would probably write this as pi over 2 times e to the 1 times 2 minus e to the 0 times 2. And for full simplification, I'd write it as pi over 2 times e squared minus 1. Any questions or clarifications about this before we do another one? Another one. Okay. So, same sort of deal. This might just be a setup. It's Actually, in the reading, it might be hard. We're going to set up the integral for the volume obtained by revolving the region between the curves f of x equal to x squared plus 6x plus 2, and g of x equal to mm, x minus 4. That's probably going to work out all right. I think that works out just fine. Yeah. Around the x-axis. OK. We probably don't need to draw a picture here. You certainly could, but I'm not super great at drawing weird parabolas that are not just like nice x squared plus something or shifted left or right. So I'm going to kind of abstain from that for a minute. We know the basic idea. The volume is going to be very, very, well, I, yeah, maybe I should draw the picture a little bit. I don't really want to draw the picture though. So here's what I point out before I start writing this. We're certainly going to need where these two things intersect each other because we probably have something that looks vaguely like this. 
we have an upward opening parabola and we have a line with a positive slope. And we need to find these points of intersection. Mm. Mm, I might have made not a mistake, but there might have been something I didn't think about, which is silly. So I, yeah. Here's the problem with the problem I just wrote. I think my region crosses the x-axis, right? Like the x-axis is goes through it, which is a problem. So I'm going to change the axis of rotation. I'm going to change it to five, six, two, three, minus, minus, minus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, actually, I think I'm good. I think I'm all right. Really, James? Sorry. Sorry, now I have that. Just let me do a real quick check here. No, I am. Okay, so let's find the point of intersection. So to find the point of intersection, we're going to set f of x equal to g of x. So we're going to get x squared plus 6x plus 2 equal to x minus 4. We bring everything to one side. You get x squared plus 5x plus 6 equal to 0. You factor. You get x plus 2 times x plus 3 equal to 0. So your limits of integration are going to be x equal to negative 2 and x equal to negative 3. Yeah, so I actually, I'm actually safe here with this axis of rotation. So I'll point out that I didn't really want to graph this, but I will say that my graph is completely below the x-axis. So if you plug in negative three to this function, you get negative seven. Plug in negative two to this function, you get negative six. So this value here is negative three, negative seven. And this value here is negative two, negative six. So all of this is below your x-axis, kind of like that. Kind of weird like that. That seem reasonable? Or do you want me to explain that a little bit more? It's not really going to change the problem at all. The only issue I was concerned about in my head was that if this had actually been on top of the x-axis, it would have fallen. No. So, usual situation, trying to find the volume of this thing revolved around the x-axis. Mm, kind of usual, kind of maybe a little bit a atypical in, in one way. Usually our region is like above the x-axis, kind of weird for it to be below. Still totally fine. Um, so we know that we're going to do the integral from, is the, what's the bottom limit here? The negative two or is it negative three? Right, it's negative three, it's negative two. Pi times your larger radius squared minus your smaller radius squared dx. So we're looking at this little strip here. And yeah, it's kind of funky. Here's my big radius. It's the function that's further away. And in this case, the further away function is the parabola, which we can see because, well, really we kind of had to graph it or, yeah, it's kind of, I've kind of thought, I kind of picked a funky problem here, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you kind of have to graph it here to see which one's further away. You could pick a point between negative three and negative two and plug it in, but that, you have to use a fraction. Gross. The way I would actually think about this is if you have an upward opening parabola, which this is, an upward opening parabola is always below a straight line. Right? There's no way I could draw a straight line that would be below an upward opening parabola and still cross it twice. The issue here is that since everything is below the x-axis, the parabola is actually the bigger radius because it's further away from the x-axis. So I'm not going to like this, but my larger radius is... It's not x squared plus 6x plus 2. It's actually 0 minus x squared plus 6x plus 2. Because it's the axis of rotation, which is 0 minus the thing that's below it. It doesn't actually matter here because you end up squaring it. So the order of subtraction doesn't really matter. But if I'm trying to show you the right thing here, technically it should be 0 minus your function. Just like if this was on top, we would do our function minus zero. We just don't usually write that. Same deal over here. The smaller radius would be zero minus 
x minus 4 squared, which I will admit is a little bit gross. Yeah. Let's do two more things here. I want to kind of point out something a little bit less gross. Let's say we had a slightly easier situation where our parabola was 6x minus x squared. And our other function was g of x equal to x. Which is much easier to draw. So here's your g of x equal to x. And 6x minus x squared, you factor out an x times 6 minus x. And so your intercepts are 0 and 6. So this downward opening parabola looks something like this. Again, with two points of intersection. And if we want to find the volume of this region revolved around the x-axis, again, same idea as usual. The volume is going to be the integral of pi times your larger radius squared minus your smaller radius squared. We're going to find the limits of integration the same way we did before. We're going to set the two functions equal to each other. I would probably bring everything to the right. Say zero equals x squared, and then x minus 6x is minus 5x, and factor out an x to get zero equal to x times x minus 5. So your limits of integration are not surprisingly x equals zero, and a little more surprisingly, but not really, x equal to 5. So then to find the volume here, if we look at a strip perpendicular to our axis of rotation. Here's my small radius. Here's my larger radius. And here's what I was saying before, maybe not super well. My large radius is really this top function minus zero. It's the difference between your function and your axis of rotation. It's just that when the axis of rotation is the y at the x-axis, we don't really think about it that much. But we're going to think about it in a second, I promise. So here, our volume would be pi times the integral from 0 to 5. Our further away function is 6x minus x squared. We're squaring that. Our closer function is x squared. OK, we're going to do one more thing with this. We want to do the same thing, but now, the axis of rotation is y equal to 10. So it's this line up here, which uh, I checked is fully above the region. So if we're, if we're rotating around this axis of rotation, now my larger radius is the distance to the function that's further away, which is the straight line. And the smaller radius, excuse me, is the distance to the closer function, which is the parabola. So in this situation, my large radius is going to be, that's y equals 10, 10 minus the straight line equation, which is x. My smaller radius is going to be 10 minus the parabola equation, which is 6x minus x squared. This, I hope, might make it a little more clear as to why in the previous page, I wasn't just saying it was the function. It was really 0 minus the function, because it was the difference between the axis of rotation and the further away function and the axis of rotation and the closer function. And I have to do the subtraction in the right order to be technically correct. Again, I will say, if you happen to get the order of subtraction incorrect, when you have like a different axis of rotation, it technically doesn't make a difference because you end up squaring. But 
I'm going to show you the right way, not the technical way. Okay, so in this problem, our volume would be pi integral, same limits of integration because I still have the same region, just a different axis. So my limits of integration are still zero to five. And then my large radius is going to be 10 minus x, and we're squaring that minus my small radius, which is 10 minus 6x minus x squared. We're squaring that. Some questions over here. Why is the parabola r squared and not the line? Um, because in this problem here, the parabola is the function that is further from the axis of rotation. And yes, all of these problems, except for the very first one I did, have been washers because they've all had an outer radius and an inner radius, except for the very first one around the y-axis where the inner radius was zero because our region was flush with the axis of rotation. Other questions about these things we've just done? Yeah. Um, can you repeat why it's from 0 to 5 and it's probably going to be 0 to 5? Well, sure. So this region, these two, like the, re the region between these two curves starts at x equals 0 and ends at x equals 5. And the way we found that was by setting these two functions equal to each other to figure out where they intersect. Mm -hmm. So technically, I would point out that this point here is the point 0, 0, and this point of intersection is the point 5, 5. But whether I'm rotating around this axis or this axis, my strip still slides as far left as x equals 0 and as far right as x equals 5. That region isn't changing if I change the axis of rotation. All right. So there's volumes of revolution. Done. <laughs> Not that we couldn't do more, but yeah. Go. Like the like I squared and I maybe evaluate it. Sure. So so yes, but I will say I'm gonna make it easy because I usually we don't ask those questions on a final because we're like we it's kind of like in 17a in your first midterm, you probably had a limit definition of the derivative question, and then you probably didn't see one on your final. Well, maybe like that's something you had a teacher that was but anyway. That's pretty typical, where like we do the limit definition thing on the first or in the first test, and then you don't do it on the final. That said, yes, I will still do. It. So let's say we want to write the limit definition of the following interval. We're gonna make it. Hmm, yeah, easy is challenging here. So we'll say the integral from zero to three, we want to be linear or quadratic, fine, we'll go quadratic, but let's make it not terrible, James. Three X squared plus four X minus five. Okay, so we have a few things to figure out. The first thing is we need to know the limit definition. So I remind you that in general, for the integral from A to B of F of X DX, the limit definition is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i times delta x, where delta x is equal to b minus a over n, and x sub i is equal to a plus i times delta x. I use i, so we'll use k, so we'll use j. It's the same difference. So in this problem, we're going to identify delta x and x sub i and then what f of x sub i is. So our delta x here is 3 minus 0 divided by n, which is 3 over n. Our x sub i is 0 plus i times delta x, which just ended up being 3i over n. And then you might choose to write this out on its own, f of x sub i. I should be super clear here. The function we're integrating is our f of x. So f of x of i is just going to be that same function, but instead of x's, we're replacing the x's with x of i. So instead of having four times, sorry, three times x squared, I'm going to have three times three i over n squared, and four times three i over n. 
So then tossing that all into the formula here, our integral from zero to three of three x squared plus four x minus five dx is gonna equal the limit, then goes to infinity of the sum, and i equals one to n of this mess here. Three times three i over n squared plus four times three i over n minus five, all times our delta x, which is three over n. And remind me, we did do the thing where like you use the formula for the sum from i one to n, it's like n times n plus one over two. Yeah, we, okay, I thought so, I just wanted to make sure. So the next part of this process is to essentially multiply this all out and break it up into as many summations as necessary. Here, we're gonna get one, two, three summations because there's three parts added to track. So we multiply the whole thing out. The limit then goes to infinity of the sum from i plus one to n. Holy smokes. Um, and let's kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna maybe skip a step here or at least talk about this step. So three i over n squared is nine i squared over n squared times three is 27 times another three is 81. I'm gonna get 81 i squared over n squared times n is n cubed. The next term, four times three times three is 12 times three is 36. So it's 36 i over n times n is n squared. And finally, the last part here is minus five times three over n, which is minus 15 over n. I'm in good shape because I noticed that every power of n is one larger than the corresponding power of i. That is always what you want to see if you're doing this kind of problem. Break it up, pull out the constants. So we're gonna rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity <laughs> of three sums. The first one's gonna be 81 over n cubed times the sum from i equals one to n of i squared. The next one's gonna be 36 over n squared times the sum from i equals one to n of i. And you kind of have your choice here. I'm gonna write the next one as minus 15 over n times the sum from i equals one to n of one. So basically factoring or pulling out all the constants in front of the summations. Then we have to use the formulas. That's gonna be the limit as n goes to infinity of 81 over n cubed. The sum of i squared from i equals one to n is n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. I don't know if you're expected to memorize this or if it will be provided if needed. Uh, did you have to memorize it for the first test? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, plus 36 over n squared times the sum of i is n times n plus 1 over 2. And finally, 15 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of 1. It's just n, you're adding up one n times, so you get n. Finally, we take the limit. So I wanna point out that the top of this is 81 times n times n times two n. So it's like 81 times two times n cubed plus some smaller things. On the bottom here, we have a six n cubed. And using that kind of shortcut, the limit of a rational function as n goes to infinity is if the powers, I should say the degrees are the same, it's the quotient of the leading coefficients. So the limit of this right here is gonna be 81 times two over six. Similarly, the limit of this part here is gonna be 36 over two, because you have a 36 n squared over a two n squared. And here the n's just cancel and you get minus 15. In case what I'm saying is a little bit unclear, just to be super extra clear about it, what I'm saying right here is that you have the limit as n goes to infinity of 81 times 2n cubed plus oh man, 3n squared plus n over 6n cubed. And if you multiply that out, you have the limit as n goes to infinity of 81 times 2n cubed plus 81 times three 
n squared plus 81 times n over 6n cubed. But these are the only things that matter. So you get 81 times 10. You should ask questions if you have questions. Okay, so then finally we get, I don't know, we cancel a two here and a two here. We cancel a three here and a three there. And we get 27 plus 18 minus 15, which is 30. I can't even say it anymore. I would say, I wouldn't expect to see that, but again, I don't know what, I, I don't really know if that's an accurate statement or not. I don't think there'd be a question like that on your final, but anything there. Yeah, sure. Let me grab an example because they're not always easy to come up with. So, why not do that one? Oh, let me see. Make sure I got my own. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Don't love that example. Sure. So, Let's say we're given the following matrix to start off with. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, I'm having trouble deciding what I really want. Yeah, diagonal relation. Let's say we're given the following matrix. A equal to five, six, one, zero. Sure, that'll work. There's cut, yeah, go ahead. Um, what I, 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 would that probably be given by the or not? I could, I don't think so. You, we, we, we haven't really learned the steps to diagonalize in a three by three matrix. Not that you couldn't, but it's, it's more, it's the same sort of process, but it's more complicated than for a two by three. So I really would think it would be a two by two matrix if you'd be asked to diagonalize. So usually this kind of question, gets asked in one of two ways. You can either be asked to say like, find A to some power, like A to the 30th power, or you might be told like, this represents some sort of system, like a population growth, and you're given some initial population, like N not equal to 1810, and then ask, okay, what's the population 30 generations later? So in other words, what is A to the 30th times N naught? Those are the two varieties of that kind of question. Well, let's look at the first variety first, because we'll kind of look at we'll kind of look at both of them because there's there's kind of two ways of answering this question, which is a little annoying. And I do think you kind of saw both of them. Um yes to the question that was just asked, but I'm not exactly sure what you're asking there. So if you could clarify, I'm happy to go over that. I just don't know what you're asking for yet. I think I have an idea, but I'm not sure. Um, so looking at this, let's find just A to the 30th first. So to find A to the 30th, or to do this, either way, whenever you're doing this process of stuff that looks like diagonalization, I know I didn't say the word diagonalization here, because I wrote it there, but like if you just saw this and someone said find A to the 30th power, that means you need to diagonalize, which means you first have to do what? Eigenvalues, eigenvectors, then you find P, then you find P inverse, and then you can diagonalize. Okay, so um, eigenvalues. So we're going to take the determinant of A minus lambda I, set it equal to zero. So to find A to the 30th, first eigenvalues. The easiest way you, to do this is just to write the determinant take your original matrix, don't write like your matrix minus lambda times one, zero, zero, one, just subtract lambdas in the diagonals. So you should be writing five minus lambda, six, one, zero minus lambda, or just negative lambda. And then set that equal to zero and then actually find the determinant. So the determinant is that times that, it's five minus lambda times negative lambda minus six times one equal to zero, multiply it out. 
5 times so negative lambda times negative lambda is lambda squared. 5 times negative lambda is minus 5 lambda, minus 6 equals 0. Hopefully it will factor. If it doesn't factor, you do have to use the quadratic formula. Hopefully that won't be the case. Factor, you get lambda minus 6 times lambda plus 1. Be careful with these 6s and 5s. Sometimes it's like a 6 and a 1. Sometimes it's a 2 and a 3, depending on what the signs are. So just be extra careful. So we've got two eigenvalues. We've got lambda 1 equal to positive 6 and lambda 2 equal to negative 1. Or call them whatever you want. You could say lambda 1 was negative 1 and lambda 2 was positive 6. It doesn't actually matter as long as we keep the order the same. All right, now we find the eigenvectors. Um, you might have a different, no, I don't have a different way. So eigenvectors, can you see that? Okay, so eigenvectors. So for lambda one equal to six, I would always, always is a strong word, James. I would generally, if the eigenvalue is nice, meaning an integer, not something like three plus root seven or yeah, yeah, I would do it like this. I would set a times my eigenvector equal to lambda times my eigenvector, but actually write it out. That's going to be five, six, one, zero times the thing I'm trying to find. I don't know what the eigenvector is yet, equal to six times x. And generally, you only need the first equation. Although occasionally you have you can't use it or it doesn't help you. Like if you get 3x equal to 3x, it doesn't tell you anything. You have to use the second equation. Here, the first equation gives us 5 times x plus 6 times y equals 6 times x. Subtracting 5x from both sides, I get 6y equal to 1 times x. As a reminder, easiest way to find the eigenvector at this point, well, there, I could say there's two easy ways. One way is literally pick a number for y. I'm going to pick 1. And then x, if y is 1, x has to be 6. The other way to see this, which I kind of have, tend to prefer, is x is equal to the coefficient of y, and y is equal to the coefficient of x. Any non-zero multiple of this choice is an equally valid choice. So you could have made a different choice and said, I'm going to pick 1, 1, 6, which is something some people like to choose. I would definitely not recommend using a fraction unless you really, really have to. So this is the best choice, in my opinion. Two things to say about this. Thing one, if you had used the second equation, it would have worked out the same. The second equation would have been 1 times x plus 0 times y equals 6 times y. Which actually is easier a little bit. But look, literally the same equation. x equals 6y, x equals 6y. So you're still going to get the same eigenvector, whichever equation you use. So don't fret about using one equation versus the other. And the other thing, I said there was two things. There was another thing. What was it, James? Good question. I really did have something else to say there. Guess not. Um, find the other eigenvector. Why don't you all find the other eigenvector? So for lambda 2 equal to negative 1, I want you all to figure out what your eigenvector needs to be for a times v2 equal to lambda 2 times v2.
would point out for this one, although I always generally tend to opt to use the first equation, the second equation is much easier. If you use the second equation, you get one times x plus zero times y equals negative one times y. Or x equals negative y. So in this case, that's probably the easier. Not that you couldn't do the first way. You're going to get your second eigenvector is either you can either do one negative one or negative one one, whichever way you like. If I pick y equal to one, x has to be negative one. But it doesn't matter. Pick whatever you pick and then just stick with it. Okay. So then here's what we know. Um, if I did the first, no, if I did the first equation, I should get the same result. So if I, so just to double check here, well, I know what I was going to show. If I use the first equation, my first equation would be 5x plus 6y equals negative x, right? Because it's 5 times x plus 6 times y equals negative 1 times x. And then subtracting 5x from both sides, I get 6y equal to negative x minus 5x is negative 6x. So I do get still y equal to negative x, which still leads to the eigenvector. So be very careful here, right? No matter which equation you use, with the exception that sometimes one equation doesn't help you at all, but if both equations yield a result, the result should give you the same eigenvector. Yeah. Could the vector also be y minus? Definitely. Any, any non-zero multiple of the vector I wrote here is an equally valid choice. You can pick one, negative one. You can pick three, negative three. I can pick negative four, four. Any multiple, just not the zero vector. Either one is okay. And here, so here, so here's the answer. The vector we're looking for, which there are many choices that are correct, only has to meet the requirement that it's not the zero vector and it's a solution to this equation. So let me point out up here. This vector 6, 1, if I do 5, 6, 1, 0 times the vector that I found, it's going to equal 5 times 6 plus 6 times 1, which is 30 plus 6, and 1 times 6 plus 0 times 1, which is 6, which is exactly 6 times the eigenvector. But I could have made any other choice, and it still would have worked. Let me show you what I mean. If I had picked instead... I don't know, pick something ridiculous, like, don't pick something ridiculous because it's going to be hard to multiply out, but pick something semi-ridiculous, like, I don't know, negative 30, negative 5. That's also an eigenvector because it's a multiple of my eigenvector, and look what happens. When I multiply this out, 5 times negative 30 is negative 150, 6 times negative 5 is negative 30, and you add those together, you get negative 180, 1 times negative 30 plus 0 times negative 5 is negative 30. And look at that. It's exactly six times the thing I chose to be the eigenvector. It's not a coincidence. Any choice is a valid choice. So down here, I picked negative 1, 1 because I wanted to. And 5, 6 times, what, sorry, 5, 6, 1, 0 times negative 1, 1 gives me the vector negative 5 plus 6 and negative 1 plus 0 which is exactly negative one times my choice of eigenvector. But if you had picked instead the opposite of that, it still works because you get five times one plus six, six times negative one, which is negative one, and one times one plus zero is one, which is exactly negative one times your choice of eigenvector. So I'll reiterate. Once you have an eigenvector, any multiple is going to work out. So we could all pick different things and all be right. Which is why we talk about the eigenline. Because the eigenline is the line that contains all of the eigenvectors, and you don't have to be super specific about it. So that's more of a 17C thing that we'll talk about next time. Okay, we have the eigenvalues, we have the eigenvectors. Let's write down all the stuff. So just to keep things in order here, our first eigenvalue was 6. The corresponding eigenvector that I picked was 6, 1. Our second eigenvalue was negative 1. The corresponding eigenvector was I picked negative 1, 1. Although usually if I had a choice, I'd probably make the first component positive, but I happen to not. So then we write down the matrix P. 
And once you decide on the order the eigenvectors go in P, everything else is kind of fully determined for you. Usually, right, the first eigenvector is the first column and the second one is the second column, but you can actually order it any way you want. So I'm going to say that P is equal to the first column being 6, 1, the second column being negative 1, 1. Once you've made that choice, the next thing you should write down is that D has to be the first eigenvalue in the first column. So it's going to be a 6 there, a 0 here, a 0 here, and a negative 1 here. First eigenvalue in the first diagonal spot, second eigenvalue in the second diagonal spot. And then we should find P inverse. So P inverse is going to be 1 over the determinant of P. And then we're going to interchange the 6 and the 1, change the signs of the other two things. I will stress here, we didn't interchange those two, right? Those didn't switch places. We changed them to the negatives of themselves, which happened to get the same result. But okay. So that's going to be 1 over, let's see, the determinant of P is 6 minus minus 1, 7. And I wouldn't multiply that out. I would leave that as is. And then we get to say that a to any power is equal to p times d to that same power times p inverse. So that means that a to the, did I say 30th power? I know it's been forever since I started this problem. A, I think I said 30th. A to the 30th power is going to be p, which is 6, negative 1, 1, 1. D to the 30th, so 6, 0, 0, negative 1 to the 30th power, times P inverse, which is 1 7th times 1, 1, negative 1 to 6. And if I was trying to use my time efficiently, I would probably only do one thing here. Eh, maybe two things. That 1 7th doesn't need to live right there. That constant can go anywhere you want. And if you were actually going to multiply this all out, you would. Maybe not even introduce it at all, but maybe if you were going to, you do it at the very end of the process. So I'm going to write this as one seventh times six negative one one one, and then this matrix here, the diagonal matrix raised to a power, is the special case where just each of the diagonal things get raised to that power. So six zero zero negative one to the thirtieth power is equal to six to the thirtieth zero zero negative one to the 30th, which is positive one. I should have picked an odd power, so it'd be negative one, but a lot. And then here's the rest of P inverse. One, one, negative one, six. And I would probably leave it there. If we were actually asked to multiply it out, things get kind of gross. Um, I, but here's, here's what would happen. So if you had to multiply it out, I would probably multiply these two together first and get one seventh times six negative one 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 and then you have six to the thirtieth times one plus zero times negative one that's going to be a six to the thirtieth you have this with that which is also a six to the thirtieth you have this with that which is a negative one you have this with that which is a positive six and then we continue on then you have this matrix times this matrix so so actually watch this for a second so this with this 6 times 6 to the 30th, let's write 6 to the 31st. And then negative 1 times negative 1 is plus 1. And then this with that is, is again, 6 to the 31st. And then plus negative 1 times 6 is minus 6. And then 1 times 6 to the 30th minus 1, so 6 to the 30th minus 1. And then 6 to the 30th plus 6. Not the worst thing I've ever seen, but I wouldn't go there unless I had to. So that is that is this matrix raised to a power, which we have done via diagonalization. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know. Take a look at that. Um, now, what if instead they had asked us to do the other thing? Well, in fact, here's here's the way I'm really trying to get at. What if they said, find a to the 30th times n naught 
and express it in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here's what this isn't asking me to do. It's saying, I don't want you to take your a to the 30th you just found, which is, so here's, don't write this down. We're not doing this. We're not doing one seventh times here's, or I guess all of this is a to the 30th. And then I think and not, I know it's been forever since I mentioned and not, and not was something special. Um, it was 1810. They're not just asking you to multiply this out because it's really not showing you where the eigenvalues and the eigenvalues, what they are, right? You're not using them. So here's what they mean when you, they ask you to do this. We're going to go back to A to the 30th being P inverse D to the 30th times P. And then we're going to multiply both of those things back. Uh, uh, oh, I got the P and the P inverse backwards. And then we're going to say that A to the 30th times N naught is equal to our P times D to the 30th times P inverse times N naught, which is going to be P times D to the 30th times our P inverse, which I am going to write out, which I know, I know. There's lots of things here. Times our n naught, which that's a fine choice of n naught, I suppose. Okay, here's how this ends up going down. This is going to end up equaling, and again, I'm just writing this for simplicity's sake, really. P times d to the thirtieth, and we're actually going to multiply this out here, which is probably going to be uh, it might actually work out okay. So let's see, multiplying this out. 1 times 18 plus 1 times 10 is 28 plus 10, which, sorry, is 18 plus 10, which is 28. And negative 1 times 18 plus 6 times 10 is negative 18 plus 60, which is 42, which are both divisible by 7. Awesome. So you get P times D to the 30th times 4, 6. And here's how the rest of this breaks down. This ends up meaning that this is going to equal four times your first eigenvalue to the 30th power times your first eigenvector plus six times your second eigenvalue to the 30th power times your second eigenvector. Because that's really what this is right here. This whole thing here, this P, P is your first eigenvector and your second eigenvector, and D is your first eigenvalue to the 30th power and your second eigenvalue to the 30th power. So you're just getting that times that and that times that and then multiplied by this and this respectively. So that's why it works out that way. Um, so in this case, we'd have four times six to the 30th times your first eigenvector, which was six one plus six times your second eigenvector, which was negative one to the 30th probably don't need to write that, but I kind of like writing it to show that I know what I'm doing, times the second eigenvector, which is negative one. If you look really hard, you can probably justify to yourself that this ends up being the same as this, but it would be terrible to actually do this part. Let me say one more thing. I saw on, I think, discussion sheet 10 for Dell that he gave you something kind of different. He said, instead of doing that, let me let me pretend like I told you. So I told you that my initial population vector, 1810, I told you that that was four times the first eigenvector. Four? Four, James? Yeah, four. Well, I feel dicey about this, but we'll see plus six times the second eigenvector. Let's check that out. Four times six, one, plus six times negative one, one, is equal to 24 minus six, and four, yep, totally works. So, 
this last way of doing it is probably meant to be the easiest way of doing it. So I told you this, and then I asked you, what is a to the 30th times n naught? So here's the idea here. And I really want to stress this because this is probably the most like, do you understand what's going on question you can ask? Like as far as dilution, like this is the one where it's like, you're just using the fact that you know about what an eigenvalue and an eigenvector really do. So watch for a second. I'm going to say, well, great. And not, you just told me was four times my first eigenvector plus six times my second eigenvector. So a to the 30th times n naught is really a to the 30th times four times your first eigenvector plus six times your second eigenvector, which we could write out, but I don't really want to because matrix multiplication distributes, constants don't really matter or they don't matter where they are, they do matter. So then we could rewrite this as four times a to the 30th times the first eigenvector plus six times a to the 30th times the second eigenvector. And a times the eigenvector is equal to the eigenvalue times the eigenvector. And if you keep doing that, it just keeps giving you the eigenvalue again and again and again. So a times a times the eigenvector is equal to a times the eigenvalue times the eigenvector. But then it doesn't matter where this constant lives. So really you have a times the eigenvector again, and you have lambda one times lambda one times the eigenvector, which is lambda one squared times the eigenvector. In other words, a to a power times an eigenvector is equal to the corresponding eigenvalue raised to that same power times the eigenvector. Same deal here. Hey, that looks awfully familiar. Doesn't it? That's because it's the same thing. And it's supposed to be the same thing. So... We could do it that way, but if you're kind of given and not as a linear combination of your eigenvectors, you're kind of meant to do it this way, which is easier in some sense, in a lot of senses, actually. Um, and then we can finish this off writing out the actual things. This is four times six to the 30th power times your first eigenvector plus six times negative one to the 30th power. Sorry, it's looking kind of terrible there. Apologies times your second eigenvector. And I will point out that if we had chosen different eigenvectors, like you had chosen one negative one or 12, two, your coefficients here would be slightly different than mine. So it will look different if you choose different eigenvectors. Um, so a couple of questions. So for N, so, so no, not in this. So someone asked for n not, wouldn't you multiply by 18? Like, wouldn't you do actually do the a to the 30th times n not? And we're not doing that. What we're doing is we're saying that n not is really equal to this four times v1 plus six times v2. And then we're saying instead of multiplying a to the 30th times n not, it's a to the 30th times four times v1 plus six times v2. And then using the fact that a to a power times an eigenvector is equal to the corresponding eigenvalue to the same power times the eigenvector. We're abusing that to rewrite a to the 30th times v1 as lambda 1 to the 30th times v1. That's what we're doing there. Because, so, because lambda 1, so I know it's been a while since we found lambda 1 and v1, but I'll remind everybody that our lambda one was six and the corresponding eigenvector we chose was six one. And our lambda two was negative one and the corresponding eigenvector was V two equal to negative one. That's why I'm using six and negative one because this, this here is six and this here is negative one. Yeah. 
So, so in this version of the problem, they were given to us. Just like in the discussion sheet, they they told you there was some discussion sheet problem where they're like, here are your eigenvectors, or it was really kind of like, here are some vectors. What happens when you multiply the matrix by them? Oh, you get a multiple of them. For eigenvectors, right? And then they said whatever the coefficients were, those happen to be the eigenvalues. So, like this problem, if I really wanted to kind of go a little bit further, I could have gone back and said, okay. Here's our matrix A equal to, I don't remember what it was. It's been forever ago. Five, six, one, zero. And tell me, what is, if I say that so some vector U1 is like, say, six, one, what is A times U1? Well, five, I know we've done this before, but I'm doing it again. If we do this multiplication, we get, Five times six plus six times one, and one times six plus zero times one. And then if I asked you, what's an eigenvalue of this matrix? Well, you say, oh, this matrix times this vector is exactly equal to six times that vector. So I can say lambda one equal to six must be an eigenvalue. And similarly, if I said u2 is equal to negative 1, 1, and I asked what a times u2 is and got 5, 6, 1, 0 times negative 1, 1, and then I'm getting negative 5 plus 6, negative 1 plus 0, that's exactly negative 1 times the original vector. So that means lambda 2 equal to negative 1 must be an eigenvalue. But this is a way on that discussion sheet where he gave you some random vectors and then asked you to do a thing and then was hoping you would see that since the matrix times the vector was a multiple of the vector, that that vector is an eigenvector and the multiple is the eigenvalue. And so then after we pretended like we didn't know that those two vectors were eigenvectors, then on the, out, the oh my gosh, the discussion sheet, he said something like, now we're going to say that this vector n naught is this linear combination of your eigenvectors. But it was just kind of handed to you. And then you were asked to do this sort of thing with it. So that's the version of this problem that I would probably ask on the test because I think it's kind of, again, the most thought provoking and it makes you kind of use this fact the most. But really, it could kind of occur in any of the ways we just talked about it, as far as talking about diagonal equation. Couple questions over here. Um, so someone asked for midterm three over oh, midterm three. I don't have the midterm. I don't. Sorry, I don't know what midterm three problem one C is. Um, and I don't think I have like the I have the practice problems, but I don't think that's what you're referring to. Yes, the answer would be what I wrote last. Yeah, 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 yeah. This this here is how I would leave this because this is written in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the question that this person asked about is to find a matrix raised to the 200th power. And exactly, you would probably do it, if you're just doing the matrix to a power, you do it like our first iteration of this problem, which was, you know, finding eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and then saying, you know, your a to the 30th is, P times D to the 30th times P inverse, or in this case, C to the 30th would be P times D to the, sorry, to the 200th would be your P times D to the 200th times your P inverse. Yeah, that's how you find it. A matrix to a power should ring alarm bells. It should be like, oh, I'm finding diagonalization. If you're, if you're asked to find a matrix to any power like higher than three. Okay. Um, how so someone asked, and it's not a bad question, I just don't know if I want to answer it. How would the solution be different if the eigenvector we chose was one negative one and not negative one one? It's a good question. Um, so it would affect what so if we look at this here, right, we would have we'd have a slightly different p, we have a slightly different p inverse, and we'd have slightly different oh sorry, there's a way over here. 
we would have slightly different coefficients instead of four and six we'd have i think we'd probably have like four and negative six as our coefficients instead of four and positive six so choosing a different eigenvector only really affects what these coefficients are and also your p and your p but like that's i think obviously it's gonna affect these numbers i know it's not like a fully like full answer but it's what i got for now so I would say when you're picking an eigenvector, try to make the easiest choice. Pick an eigenvector that, if possible, both things are integers and as small as possible. So even though you could pick 12, 2, pick 6, 1. Yeah. I have a question. For this eigenvector, like negative 1, 1, yes. doesn't it have to be negative 1, 1? Because it's like the order of like x and then y, so it's just like because I did that on one of the quizzes. Yeah. And what's the, like, I had them one and two, uh -huh. and I switched them, and they told me it had to be this way. That is not true, unless they gave you more information about something that, like, unless there was some other additional information that was making, so you had to pick this choice. Like, for example, in that in that discussion sheet, they gave you the eigenvectors, and they gave you the linear combination, so you couldn't use a different version of the eigenvector because of how they've given you the coefficients already. But, but you should be able to, if you're just asked to diagonalize and not given anything further, you should be able to use any eigenvector you want. Um, yeah. So there was a question about something, a, a very different topic. So I should say, are there more diagonalization questions before we switch gears for us in a different way? We can certainly come back to it if we want to. All right. So somebody asked um, about, oh yeah, one of these kind of... Um, volume of a thing where cross sections perpendicular to a thing are some sort of shape thing. So for example, and I don't I don't love eh, circle is never my favorite choice, but fine. We can do a circle. So we can do something like we'll do two of these. We'll say find or maybe set up the volume of the shape where the region is a circle of radius six and cross sections perpendicular to the circle are the first version we'll say are squares. Um, I want to point out, oh, that looks very blurry. If your shape's a circle, they don't have to tell you like which direction your cross sections are because it doesn't matter, right? Whether they're perpendicular to the x-axis or the y-axis, you're still getting the same shape because the circle has symmetry. But if it was some other shape that wasn't symmetrical, they would say like cross sections perpendicular to the x-axis are squares or whatever. But I'm not saying that here because I don't need to. So in this case, we've got a circle of radius six, and the cross sections coming out of it are squares that look like kind of like that. And so we're going to add up the volume of all these squares. So this square here, the volume of my square or my slice or whatever you want to call it is however long this side is, I'm going to call it L squared times the thickness, which is dx. So we need to find out what L is in terms of the variable that we want to use, which is x. So here's the idea. I'm going to draw this picture again. I don't really want the square there. That was just for visual purposes. So here is my blank L. And I'm going to draw kind of the only segment I can draw that I know anything about. I can draw the segment from the origin to that corner right there. And I know that the length of that is 6. I'm going to say that this length is x. This length is y. And then Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals 6 squared. 
or if you prefer, equation of a circle, x squared plus y squared equals six squared. That's an equally valid way of getting there. So then I'm trying to figure out what, what actually twice y is because my length is two times whatever y is. So solving for y, y squared equals 36 minus x squared. y is equal to the square root of 36 minus x squared. I don't care about a plus or minus here. My length of the side of my square is two times that. And my length squared, really I could have just used this and said my length squared was four y squared. If I do it this way, it's going to be two times the square root of 36 minus x squared squared, which is going to be two squared times 36 minus x squared. Which you can also get about by doing four times y squared. Oh, same thing. So then the total volume, we're going to add up all of the square volumes from as far left as negative six to as far right as positive six. Which is not too terrible. Um, you can factor out the four. The integral of 36 is 36 X. The integral of X squared is X cubed over three from negative six to six. So that's something. If you actually have to calculate this, I'll point out there is something you can do to make it slightly easier. You can say that since this function is even, you can say that this is two times the integral from zero to six of four times 36 minus six squared. You don't have to do this. And if you don't know to do this, then don't think about doing it. But if you like making something simpler before you actually have to calculate it, you can do it this way. It's not a lot simpler, but you do get eight times 36x minus x cubed over three, but then you're just going from zero to six, which people might think is easier. It's slightly easier, right? And I don't want to go further really, but I will. You get eight times 36 times six minus six cubed, which is also 36 times six. And I would stop there. And if I had time, then if you if you needed to simplify, you would come back and simplify, but don't simplify this if you have other problems to do. Simplifying this is not worth a whole lot of points. Um, no, the question is, would you multiply by pi? There is no pi to multiply by here because this is not a volume of revolution. I didn't revolve this shape around an axis to get the volume. So there is no pi to multiply by here. Okay, question. Well, because this part right here, that's the, how long, that's, how, that's the value of y. But this length here is twice that. Or if you prefer, you could say it's the top function minus the bottom function. And the top function is the square root of 36 minus y squared. And the bottom function is negative square root of 36 minus y squared. And when you subtract them, you get 2 times the square root of 36 minus y squared. Uh, sorry, minus x squared. That's terrible, James. I should be ashamed of that. Good question. Find the volume of the shape where, where the region is a circle of radius six. That is radius. Is that what you're asking for? Oh, and cross sections perpendicular, perpendicular to the circle are, yeah, sorry about that, squares. No. The next question is, cross sections perpendicular to the circle are semicircles. Here's the good news. We've done the hard work. So instead of this shape here, we've got the same sort of thing. But now our cross section is a semicircle that's popping out of the circle like that. Well, great. We know the area of a semicircle. The area of a semicircle 
is one half pi times r squared. I will point out that here, I don't actually want this entire length. The entire length would be the diameter of my semicircle. I want the radius. So I really do want that value right there, which is just the y from the previous iteration of this problem. So in this case, my radius is just y, which is the square root of 36 minus x squared. So depending on your shape, right, you might want this entire length if your shape is a square because the area of a square is that times that. But if your area is a semicircle or a circle, you really only want half that length because the area of a circle is pi times the radius squared and the area of half a circle is half the pi times the radius squared. So here, the area of our semi, so the area, little words, oh my gosh. The area of our semicircle is one half times pi times our radius squared, which is just one half times pi times 36 minus x squared. And then just like before, the total volume is going to be the integral from negative six to six of one half times pi times 36 minus x squared. Sorry, that was kind of terrible. Very similar result. You're going to get one half pi. Let's do this. I'm going to do the tricky thing. It's going to be one half pi times two times the integral from zero to six of 36 minus x squared. Again, that's just cutting the integral in half and doubling it. This is only valid when the function you're integrating is an even function. Okay, that's pretty good. Right. So, when I'm, so exactly what I was just saying. So it is true that the integral from negative a to a of an even function is equal to twice the integral that's cut in half. Right? You're cutting it in half and you're doubling it, so you didn't really change it. That's what's happening there. But again, you have to recognize that this is an even function to be able to use that property. So if it's unclear to you, just don't do it. I probably wouldn't do it anyway. So then one half times two is, is one, so you get pi. The integral of this is 36x minus x cubed over three again. I'm gonna do this one a little bit better this time. So if I plug in the zero and the six, I get pi times, 36 times six is six times six times six minus six times six times six over three. And if you really want to simplify this quickly, here's what you could do. Factor out the six cubed. You're left with one minus one third. One minus one third is two thirds. And six cubed might be kind of terrible, but six times six times six times two thirds. You can cancel a three there and there. And then six times six is 36. And two times two is four. And 36 times four is 144. That's how much volume you got there. Again, if I was a, if this was an exam situation, stop here. And then if you have time, finish it off. But I would, he, he likes to ask setup problems. So I would imagine you're probably not going to be evaluating an integral that's super duper terrible to evaluate. You're probably just setting it up. Okay. Wow. Time really flies. It's almost 530 already. What else? Yeah. Yes, cool. I was, I was about to say, what about some differential equations? Oh, because I know that six, because I know that 36 is six times six. So really this six cubed is 36 times six, but that's just six times six times six. Okay, yeah, some, some concentration differential equations, like a tank problem, like a tank problem. So, We have a tank, a 300 gallon tank full of a solution 
with a concentration of one third of a pound of salt per gallon. Yes. Someone asked after this if we could talk about uh, area and improper intervals. So, continue on here. A solution that is concentrated at two pounds of salt per gallon is added to the mixture at a rate of four gallons per minute. If the well stirred, well mixed, whatever you want to say, the well stirred tank is drained at the same rate of four gallons per minute, set up and solve the differential equation for S of T, the amount of salt in the tank at time T. That's a lot of words. So all of this summed up in the picture is Here's our tank. It's got 300 gallons in it. How much salt is in it in the beginning? 100 pounds of salt. Because the concentration at the beginning is one third of a pound of salt per gallon and there's 300 gallons. So there's a hundred pounds of salt in this 300 gallon tank. Okay. And then into the tank, we are putting a mixture that is concentrated at two pounds per gallon at a rate of four gallons per minute. We're draining the tank at the same rate. And just to be super clear, sorry, right, the concentration of salt that's being drained is just like here, the amount of salt, sorry, just like here, the amount of salt per volume. So what we're putting in has a concentration of two pounds per one gallon. What we're taking out has a concentration of S of T pounds of salt over 300 gallons of volume. Notably here, the volume of the tank is not changing. We're putting in four gallons every minute, we're taking out four gallons every minute. If those were different than each other, we would be either adding or subtracting some multiple of T. So just to kind of, just, just so everybody's clear with this, if we were putting in six gallons per minute and still taking out four gallons per minute, then we would be adding two gallons every minute and then our concentration would be more terrible. Our concentration would be S of T divided by 300 plus 2T because every minute there are two more gallons in the tank. So just to be clear, um, which is also solvable. It's just All right, so we're going to solve, we're going to set it up and solve it. So the setup, question, yeah. Oh, right, right, yeah. So this is just kind of a different situation. I'm just saying, if we happen to be putting in six gallons per minute and taking out four gallons per minute, then specifically the concentration coming out of the tank, instead of being S of T pounds of salt divided by 300 gallons of volume, it'd be S of T pounds of salt divided by 300 plus two T gallons of volume because every minute there would be two more gallons of volume in the tank because we're adding six and taking out only but we're not really doing that. I was just kind of talking about it. So for this situation, we're gonna say that our differential equation 
ds dt, the rate of change of salt, is the amount of salt going in minus the amount of salt going out, which in this case happens to be, I don't think you need to write the units here, but I'm gonna write the units because I like to write the units the first go around. Two pounds per gallon times four gallons per minute minus S of T pounds per 300 gallons times four gallons per minute. And what should happen is the gallon should cancel so that each of these are some amount of pounds per minute. So what we're putting in here is the rate of change of S, the SDT is equal to eight pounds per minute going in minus four times S over 300 pounds going out or pounds going out per minute. And I would say that I have fairly recently changed my mind about how to do this. Normally, I would always default to doing this separately because you can do this separately. I think it's worse that way. Like I've come to the conclusion that the algebra is worse. So when you see something like this, that seems like it's gonna lend itself pretty easily to writing it as a first order linear, I would do it that way. So I'm gonna rewrite this as, you can either write it as ds dt plus, and I missed this one time, so just be careful, um, four over 300 times s equals eight, or if you prefer, you can write this as s prime, or you can write s prime plus, I guess I should reduce that fraction, four over 300 is one over 75 times s equals eight. For this kind of situation, when it's the tank problem and the stuff going in and the stuff going out are at the same rate, like same four gallons per minute, this is always relatively nice because you're always just gonna get a constant multiple of S here. So your integrating factor is not too terrible. The thing over here is also a constant, so it's not gonna be too terrible. So the, the calculations are not bad. So let's find the integrating factor. Our mu of T is gonna be E to the integral of P of T, which is just the multiple of S, which is gonna be E to the one over 75 T. We're gonna multiply everything by that. So then we're gonna have E to the, you could just write T over 75 to the one over 75 times T. So E to the T over 75 times S prime plus E to the T over 75 times one over 75 times S equal to eight times E to the T over 75. And as is always the case with this kind of situation with the first order linear differential equation, the left-hand side is always, always, always just the derivative of your integrating factor times S. You don't have to think about that at all. I mean, you, 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 I mean, that's not true. I think about it all the time. But like, it's always that. It's never anything different. It's always whatever you found from you times S, parentheses, derivative of that. We didn't change anything. We just rewrote it. But now we're going to integrate both sides and say that E to the T over 75 times your function S is equal to the integral of 8 times E to the T over 75. Cool. So here's what we got. We have that e to the t over 75 times s of t, and I'm going to write s, s of t of s, is equal to 8, and the integral of e to the t over 75 is e to the t over 75 divided by 1 over 75. Just like if we integrated e to the 3t, you get e to the 3t divided by 3 plus t. Okay, we're almost there. I would certainly rewrite this as S of T equal to uh, 75 times eight, 600, right? Here's what I'm really doing when I do that. I know that 75 times two is 150, times another two is 300, times another two is, so I'm getting 600 E to the T over 75 plus C, and I'm dividing 
I really like dividing each thing by, especially when it's like the same thing, doing it that way. So that then you can see that these cancel and you get that S of T is equal to 600 plus C E to the negative T over 75. And we're not quite done because we should find C. Because we were given an initial condition, we know that the amount of salt at time zero was 100 pounds. So we can say, great, plug in zero for T, 100 for S of T, and we get 100 equal to 600 plus C E to the zero. So it looks like C has got to be negative 500. So our final answer is that S of T is equal to 600 plus Sorry, plus, I wrote a plus already, so I'll write plus negative 500 e to the negative t over 75. That's kind of terrible, though. You should just write 600 minus 500 e to the negative t over 75. A question I could see him asking. What is the limiting amount of salt? Meaning, if you let T go on and on and on and on, in other words, you take the limit as T approaches infinity, what happens? Well, you've got E to the negative T over 75. So the limit is T goes to infinity of 600 plus, sorry, plus again, good God, can't write a minus sign, minus 500 E to the negative T over 75. This whole part is going to just go to zero. It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that means we get 600 pounds of salt. So if you let this go on and on forever and ever and ever, the amount of salt in the tank gets closer and closer and closer to 600 pounds, which might not seem very exciting until you remember that the tank holds 300 gallons of solution. And so that means our concentration Concentration, can I spell that word? Maybe concentration. Concentration is approaching 600 pounds of salt divided by 300 gallons of solution or two pounds per gallon. The not coincidentally same concentration of what we were adding to the tank the whole time. That is not a coincidence. This always happens if the amount going in and the amount going out are the same. If you let this go on forever and ever and ever, the concentration will get closer and closer and closer to the concentration of whatever is being added to the tank. Kind of, I think that's just a neat fact. Um, yeah, e to the zero is one, but we're not, but we're not getting e to the zero. We're getting e to the negative infinity. All right, so this part here, if you let t go to infinity, e to the negative infinity over seventy-five is e to a really, really negative number. And if you think about the graph of e to the x, e to a really negative number is very, very far left on the graph, which is really, really, really close to zero. Is the negative 500 part of the point zero? Yes, it's negative 500 times zero, which is zero. Thank you, good question, yeah. Yeah? Uh, why do you multiply the eight To make it look less terrible. Because, but, but, so, I mean, because if you're dividing by a fraction, we flip and multiply. So, eight divided by 175th is the same as eight times 75 over one, which is make that 75. But really, just to make it look nicer. Okay. So, people had questions. Some of us have questions about improper integrals and in area. So, Let's say, do I have a good example here? Sure. Let's do two improper integrals. Yeah, let's do two. Let's do this one. Let's say you want to find, yeah, I like that question. How we'll make it terrible. Let's show it. The integral from, mm, sure. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Yeah, let's do that. Zero to nine of, yeah, that's terrible, James. Sure. Three over the cube root of 
x minus 1. So this is a problem where you might accidentally miss the fact that it's improper. But it is improper. Where is this function that we're integrating undefined? x equals 1. So we have to break it up at the place where it's undefined if it's not one of the endpoints already. So first step, write this as the integral from 0 to 1 of 3 over the cube root of x minus 1. I should have probably written that as x minus 1 to the 1 third when I was doing this first step. Oh, well. Plus, I'll write the second one that way. The integral from 1 to 9 of 3 over x minus 1 to the 1 third power. And then we would write each of those with limits replacing the part that's a problem. So here, the first part is going to be the limit as b approaches 1 of the integral from 0 to b. And I'm going to write this as 3 times x minus 1 to the negative 1 third power. Plus the limit as a approaches 1 of the integral from 1, some from a to 9 of 3 times x minus 1 to the negative 1 third power. Technically, I should be approaching 1 from the left here, because if I'm between 0 and 1, I'm certainly on the left side of 1. And here, if I'm between 1 and 9, I'm certainly on the right side of 1. Probably not super duper important, but everything counts, I guess. OK, so now we have to integrate this thing. So I have, since I have like, kind of like I don't know, a lot going on here, I guess let's just look at this piece first. Um, always with improper integrals, if you have more than one integral, do them one at a time. Because if one of them diverges, stop. The whole thing diverges. That's not going to happen here, though. They are both going to converge. Um, so this is going to equal the limit as b approaches 1 from the left. Fortunately, this is pretty not terrible to integrate. We get 3 times x minus 1 to the negative 1 third plus 1 is positive 2 thirds divided by 2 thirds or multiplied by the reciprocal 3 halves evaluated from 0 to b. That's going to be in the limit as b approaches 1 from the left of 9 halves, right? 3 times 3 halves is 9 halves times b minus 1 to the 2 thirds minus 9 halves times 0 minus 1 to the 2 thirds. And here you can just plug in the 1. If I plug in the 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 to a positive power is 0. So that's going to be 0 minus 9 halves times negative 1 to the 2 thirds power. Negative 1 to the 2 thirds power is positive 1. So we end up getting negative 9 halves, which is fine. It just means that this portion of the function was probably underneath the x-axis, so the area ends up being negative. And then since that part converged, we're kind of sad. That means we have to go do the other part. Fortunately, we already know the integral. We already know the antiderivative. So we can say that for the other part, the limit as a approaches 1 from the right of the integral from a to 9 of 3 times x minus 1 to the negative 1 third power. That can equal the limit as a approaches 1 from the right. Our integral is just this. So it's going to be 9 halves times x minus 1 to the 2 thirds power from a to 9. And we end up getting 9 halves times, I need to still write the limit, uh, write the limit still. The limit as a approaches 1 from the right, 9 halves times 9 minus 1 to the 2 thirds minus 9 halves times a minus 1 to the 2 thirds. When we plug in 1 for a, this part's also going to be 0 because 1 minus 1 is 0. And again, I'll stress 0 to a positive power is 0. 0 to a negative power, undefined. 0 to a positive power, 0. So then this ended up being. 9 halves times 8 to the 2 thirds power. 8 to the 2 thirds power is the cube root of 8 squared, which is 2 squared, which is 4. So we get 9 halves times 4. And then if we put these together, our total result is 4 times 9 halves plus negative 9 halves, which is really 3 times 9 halves 
which is 27 over 2. So this integral converges, and it converges to 13.5, or 27 over 2. Because each of the pieces integral was equal to a real finite number. If either of these integrals had been infinite, this thing would be divergent. So in fact, let's look at an example that shows that. So and we'll do, yeah, we can do two of these. So let's say that we were going to do the integral from, sure, one to seven of three over x, uh, sure, minus five over four. Versus the integral from one to four of three over x minus five to the four. Which, if any of these, is improper. Are any of these integrals improper? Are both of them improper? No. So this one is improper because that function is undefined where? Five and five is between one and seven. So our integral is over an interval that is undefined on for that function. Whereas here, this one is totally proper. You would just anti differentiate, plug in, find the values. So for this one, again, we have to break it up. We're going to write this as the integral from one to five of three over x minus five to the fourth dx plus the integral from five to seven of three over x minus five to the fourth, x minus five to the fourth. And let's just look at one piece. So looking at this piece, we're gonna write that as the limit as b approaches five, because we have to replace the problem point with a placeholder of the integral from one to b. And let's write this as three times x minus five to the negative. And again, we're technically approaching five from the left because we're between one and five, which means we're less than five. We anti-different, well, we write the limit as b approaches five from the left. The antiderivative here is three times x minus five to the negative third divided by negative three. We can cancel some negatives from one to b. Simplifying just a little bit, this is the limit as b approaches five from the left. Three over negative three is negative one. So we have negative one times, bless you, b minus five to the negative third minus a negative one times one minus five to the negative third. And here's where you have to be extra, extra careful. If you just plug in five, you might accidentally convince yourself that you had zero, but we don't. If you plug in five, you get negative one times zero to the negative third, plus it doesn't really matter over here, negative four to the negative third. But this here is undefined. If it helps, and I think it does help, you might rewrite it as negative one over zero to the positive third, plus I don't really care, negative four to the negative third. Zero cubed is zero, and one over zero is division by zero, which is undefined. So this diverges. And I would not try to talk about how it diverges unless someone asked me to. All right, so I didn't check to see if this is diverging to infinity or negative infinity, and I don't think you really should. Um, if we had an improper interval where the interval was some number to infinity, would, would we have to write three intervals? Well, it depends. So, I mean, it really depends. So. If, you, if your integral is something like this, like the integral from one to infinity of one over, I don't know, like x squared plus five x, that's a, that's a fine example. No, this one is, this one, you don't have to break it up because the only place this function is undefined is when x is zero, when x is negative five. And neither of those are on this interval. So this one, we would just go straight ahead and say it's the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from one to b of one over x squared plus five x. Hmm, interesting. Which I'm pretty sure is convergent because it's very similar to the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared, which we know is convergent. Um, um, sure, okay, 
So yes, that's the kind of thought you were getting at, but I wanted to make sure. So on the other, and we'll come back to this one because I think it's actually this one's worth exploring. But they're asking like, what if our integral was from I'm guessing something like three to infinity of one over x minus five, or x minus five to the third. Okay. What's for sure a problem here? Infinity, always a problem. What else is a problem here? Or a place where the function is undefined. Five. And it is a problem because we're from three to infinity. If it was from six to infinity, five wouldn't be a problem because it wouldn't be an interval. So here you would have to break this up and it would have it would suck because you have to break it up first at five. So interval from three to five of your function plus the interval from five to infinity of your function. And then additionally, you can't have two problems at a time in an integral. So you'd have to break this up even further as the integral from three to five of one over x minus five cubed dx plus the integral from five to take your pick. What's your favorite number bigger than five? Sure, 12. No one said anything, I just picked a number. But really you can pick any number. I don't recommend picking a number that might look like something else. So I wouldn't pick eight because eight infinity, you might try to write one sideways accidentally. It might sort of look like infinity or vice versa. So don't pick numbers that are easily mixed up with other numbers that you already have to deal with. Um, and then that. So if I was faced with this, I would not do this one first because I'm pretty sure that one's going to converge. I would do this one first because I'm pretty sure I'm going to get something like one over x minus five squared. And then when I plug in five, I'm going to get division by zero. So if you have multiple pieces and you have an inclination as to which part diverges, if you think one of them diverges, do that one first. Because if it diverges, stop, you're done. Don't do anything else. Say it diverges. Back to the previous integral, though, because I do think it's worth looking at. It's something we haven't talked about today. Um, that's a partial fractions problem. I know, but you're probably going to see a partial fraction. So for improper integrals, or really for anything that's definite, if it gets more complicated than just like, I know how to anti-differentiate it, or maybe a tiny mini u sub that I'm not really sure I'm going to work for, I don't want to write all this stuff the whole time through. So I would start by first just doing the indefinite integral of one over x times x plus five. Because I'm factoring it because I know it's partial fractions. So then I would say one over x times x plus five equals a over x plus b over x plus five. We'd multiply both sides by our common denominator, which is always just the denominator on the left-hand side. In this case, x times x plus five. On the right-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand side, we just get the numerator. That's always the case. On the right-hand side, we distribute a over x times x times x plus five. The x's cancel. And then b over x plus five times x plus x plus five times x times x plus five. The x plus fives cancel. And then here we can use the convenient values of x. I'm going to pick x equal to zero. I'm going to get one equal to a times zero plus five plus b times zero. So a is one fifth. And then I'm going to pick x equal to negative five. <clears throat> I'm going to get one equal to a times zero plus b times negative five. So b is negative one fifth. So then we're going to rewrite the integral as one over, I'm sorry, one fifth over x minus one fifth over x plus five. And we integrate and we get one fifth natural log of the opposite value of x minus one fifth natural log of the opposite value of x plus five. I don't know why I underlined that. I will point out, especially when they're improper, if you have a natural log minus another natural log, you almost always have to condense them down to one natural log. So I can factor out the one fifth and have the natural log of the absolute value of X minus the natural log of the absolute value of X plus five. And then I'm going to get one fifth times the natural log of the absolute value of X over X plus five. Cool. Back to the improper part. So we've done all that work. 
Now we're going to go back and say, oh, where'd, where'd you come from? Oh, yeah, that's terrible. Okay, fine. So we're going to come back here and say, great. Now this integral here, the limit as b goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to b of 1 over x squared plus 5x. Well, we know how to integrate that. The integral of 1 over x squared plus 5x is 1 fifth the natural log of the absolute value of x over x plus 5. So you have the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 fifth the natural log of x over x plus 5, 5 from 1 to b. Okay, we're almost done. I know it's kind of tedious. So then we're going to get the limit as b goes to infinity. We're going to plug in the b. So you have one fifth times the natural log of the absolute value of b over b plus five minus one fifth the natural log of one over one plus five. Okay, important question here. As b goes to infinity, what is the limit of b over b plus 5? Or let me be more explicit. Actually, show me on your fingers. What's the limit of that? Let me be a little more explicit. You have 1 times b to the first over 1 times b to the first plus 5. So you have a rational function where the top and bottom have the same degree. So the limit is 1 over 1. And then you get one fifth times the natural log of one minus one fifth times the natural log of one sixth. Natural log of one is zero, and you get negative one fifth natural log of one sixth. Or if you cared to make this look, no, I don't really care, but you could also point out that this is equal to positive one fifth natural log of six. The natural log of one sixth is the natural log of one minus one sixth. The only reason I write this is because it's more obvious this way that it's a positive answer. Not that we really care. We don't need to be positive to be convergent. You can be negative and still be convergent. So this integral is convergent. What? Converges to How long? Is natural log of six. Hello? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> it's almost like your mom. All right. Um, I would say more, but it's 559. So I guess I should probably stop the question. So this was really one question. The original question was to find the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared plus five x. So since I recognized that I was gonna have to use more technique than just knowing the antiderivative, I didn't wanna write all of this the whole time. So I first just did the antiderivative of one over x squared plus five x. I broke it apart. I recognized that I had to use partial fractions. I got my partial fraction decomposition so that one over x times x plus five was really equal to one fifth over x minus one fifth over x plus five. Then we anti differentiated each of those things to find the antiderivative. And then we went back and said, okay, great. Now we're going to do the this improper integral by using the limit. And then we just found that the antiderivative of this was equal to this. So we just used that knowledge. Sure. So the idea that's happening here is we're saying like this is similar to how if you were to take like the limit as b goes to infinity of 2b to the third plus 5b minus 1 over 7b cubed plus 6b squared plus 2, this limit would equal what? Two sevenths. Because when you take the limit to infinity of a rational function, and the degree on the top matches the degree on the bottom, then the limit is the fraction of the leading coefficients. That's always the case. And the process for doing this that you learned in 17 day, well, you should have learned in 17 day, is that you divide everything by the highest power in the denominator. So like, if you actually want to show your work here, which you shouldn't have to do, but if you want to show your work, the work is to divide everything by b cubed until you get two, plus five over b squared minus one over b cubed over seven plus six over b plus two over b cubed. And then everything being divided by some power of b, since b is getting infinitely large, that gets really small, that gets really small, that gets really small, 
that gets really small and you're left with two over seven. Same idea is true here. You could divide everything by B and then you have one over one plus five over B and the five over B would go to zero at the end. Good luck on your exam tomorrow. What time is it at? 8 a.m. All right, so don't stay up too late tonight. Get a good night's sleep. That's probably the best thing you can do for yourself at this point. Sure, you can study the rest of the afternoon, evening. I guess it's six at the evening. Eat some dinner, study a little, but don't stay up too late. Get some sleep tonight. That's the best thing you can do for yourself, I promise. But if you are going to stay up, don't sleep like two hours. That's the worst. Stay up all night or sleep at least four hours. <laughs> but really, sleep tonight, please, for yourself. You're all very welcome. Have a, have a lovely summer. I'll be around here. All right, I'm going to end it so I can get this video calm, compiling here.